So I'd like to welcome each of our speakers back onto the screen and take part in our panel session. So Corey, Curtis, Bill, Stephen, and Phil. So this session we've got, uh, let's say about 12 or 13 minutes left uh, for it. Um, viewers, if you haven't already, you can ask questions using the Q&A button and we'll get to as many as we can. So um, the first question I wanna send it around to, uh, to uh, most of you here, um, you know, have, have nuclear utilities really had their wake up call? You know, when might they come back to market in a serious way? You know, three companies here, uh, Global Atomic, Energy Fuels and Encore, both of, or all have recently signed LOIs or offtakes uh, for contracts recently. So, you know, what are utilities seeking right now? Are they demanding a lot either volume wise or from pricing? So perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on that. So Stephen, why don't you uh, start there? And I guess specifically, there is a question here, um, you know, on the structure of your offer, does it represent the 110 million you mentioned? Does that represent the ceiling of the contract? And how much of that is fixed versus market? So that's a lot of information, but uh, yeah, we use like similar to was discussed today that the floor and the midterm and the high term price. So it's a blended price. We will be able to participate in higher rising prices. Uh, this was one contract, of course, starting in 2025, running to 2030. And uh, what else did you need to know on that, David? Uh, the uh, utility. Yeah. Utilities since rush, I would say, generally speaking, uh, the utilities have had a bit of a wake-up call. We are getting more calls. We are uh, preparing additional RFPs, and um, I think the whole plan by the utilities is to d diversify their supply now and and take you know a quarter million to four hundred thousand pounds from from a producer annually. And that, that's our idea as well, is to layer in a bunch of contracts, hopefully taking into account some rising uranium prices and, uh, you know, get uh, at least a couple million pounds sold that would uh, allow us to go ahead. Okay. And uh, Curtis, congrats on your first uh, contracts here signed recently. So uh, maybe give us an update on, on that as well, what, what utilities are looking for and what you were able to offer. Sure, sure. And I, I, I completely agree with what Stephen just said. Um, it's, uh, yeah, has there been a wake-up call? Um, probably yes. Now, again, you know, the, the utilities have been pretty good about diversifying, but, um, but yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that they've uh, been much more open to, to, to come into U.S. suppliers like us. Um, I know that they've also got some real uh, bottlenecks on the, on the conversion and enrichment sides. That's maybe even been more of a wake-up call. But then you even see the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is essentially the trade association for the uh, U.S. utilities, and they're literally coming out and making public statements about moving away from Russia uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, you know, our company has been out there kind of, you know, being a bit of a voice in the wilderness talking about becoming too reliant on Russia, and, it, and, and lo and behold, it actually came about. So, um, so yeah, I, I would say that there has been some uh, somewhat of a wake-up call for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Bill, how about, how about your take on this? Well, I think it's uh, clearly a wake-up call. You know, for the better part of the last 50 years, it's uh, been producers calling uh, utilities uh, and initiating discussions. And, uh, you know, uh, it, about a month into the Ukrainian uh, situation, we noticed a, a distinct reversal in that they're calling us uh, on, on several instances of actually coming to site inspections to, uh, you know, convince themselves and verify that, you know, in fact, the deliveries can be made. Uh, so I think that uh, we're in the early stages of a, of a broad wake up. Uh, you know, I agree with, uh, with Steve and, and um, like Curtis have said, uh, especially, uh, you know, on the, uh, uh, the conversion, you know, I forget which uh, nation put out a, a RFP for UF6 uh, within the last month and there were no offers at any price. Mm -hmm. So uh, really highlighting that issue. and. You know, of the 4.3 billion that uh, has been proposed by Biden, you know, we'll probably get a smaller number, but it will probably be approved. Uh, of that, you know, the lion's share will go to conversion and enrichment, but we're all linked together. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, those are very expensive ends of the, uh, or not ends, but points in the fuel chain. And uh, the, the raw supply down here uh, is, is, you know, less, less capital intensive than, than some of those. Um, but, um, 
um, you know, I, I think it all goes hand in hand and the support is phenomenal. Uh, for once, we don't have tremendous headwinds. And uh, I think we're in for uh, you know, the best times we've seen for you know, a decade or longer since uh, pre Three Mile Island 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, Phil, Consolidated Uranium has three mines in the USA you plan to get up and running relatively quickly. So what, what's sort of the timeline and budgets involved there? And are you looking to offtake, uh, look for long-term contracts for your production? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Good question. Um, look, the way that we look at the projects is we're completing these growth programs this summer. And we want to be in a position to make a production decision by the end of the year. And that'll be predicated on price, of course, uh, and work that, we've, that we'll be doing in the background in terms of understanding the costs of, of moving these projects ahead and, uh, and also a function of the mill. So we're, you know, we're working hand in glove with energy fuels on timing of, of you know, their timing for restarting the mill. And we want to be able to deliver or when they're ready to take it, of course. Uh, in terms of contracts, I mean, look, we, we purpose built this company to gain maximum exposure to the spot price. We're not, our, our production profile, we're talking a million, a million, two, five pounds. We're not necessarily convinced that we need to sign contracts. We would like to, we, we would like to be hitting a hundred dollars when it gets there, not having sold it soon, early at a $60 contract or something like that. And we don't need, we don't need any additional capital to move these projects back into production other than what we have on the balance sheet. So we don't have a financing uh, requirement. Okay, sounds good. So, uh, Corey, uh, Anfield successfully built up its conventional project pipeline here, uh, working to delineate or confirm resources as we speak. Um, at what point do you address the condition of the Shootering Canyon Mill? Uh, why did, what might it cost to bring that mill, which is licensed, back into operation? And that will likely dictate your need for contracts. Yeah, look, I think from, from our perspective, we're, um, we're in the process right now of determining the, the cost to refurbish the mill. We've had some preliminary numbers, kind of in the 25 to $30 million range, uh, you know, a time frame of about 24 months. And, uh, you know, we're working off of that basis, you know, working with the state of Utah uh, to move the license from standby to operating. And so, uh, you know, given that timeline, obviously working in parallel to move the the, mil- the mines themselves forward uh, to a production ready status. Uh, you know, our aim is to get the mines ready for production. So as soon as the mill is up and running, we can provide feed uh, through to the mill. So, you know, I think the bottleneck here will be the mill, um, the 24 month to 30 month time frame. Uh, the mines will be up and running uh, well before that. Okay, great. Now I open this question up to the floor. You know, a couple of you are, are fairly well connected into the U.S. Uh, the government mentioned it wants to buy $4.3 billion worth of enriched uranium. Now, uranium companies don't sell enriched uranium, so this may be more of an uh, enrichment story. But do you believe this will create some uranium demand going forward? Has the, the government elaborated on this at all over the last couple of weeks? And is this above and beyond the nuclear reserve plans? Just uh, one point I would make is it's uh, it's not uh, just 4.3 billion for, for uh, uh, enriched product or conversion. It's it's spread across the board, but the lion's share is towards uh, conversion and enrichment. So it'll it'll benefit us, but um, you know clearly the emphasis is on those uh, bottlenecks, as Curtis pointed out. There's, there's those are the real bottlenecks. Well, and and I would say yeah, it, it, that that leads into this is that you know there's no there's not going to be increased demand for uranium if there's not enough conversion or enrichment capacity to, to, to supply into that. So absolutely. Um, I think that this is probably just a start. I mean, if the U.S. is truly uh, committed to restoring the nuclear fuel cycle, it's probably going to take more than $4.3 billion, honestly, uh, especially on the enrichment side. Um, but, uh, but yes, this, this, this is, a, this is a, big, uh, a big potential commitment, and this could be a big potential commitment. Uh, a catalyst for more uranium like we all are producing or hope to produce. Okay. And, and I guess sticking on to the uh, the theme of the government here, you know, the U.S. has also designated both rare earths and uranium as critical elements. Uh, has the government really put its money where its mouth is yet and provided grants to reopen operations or for R&D purposes uh, yet? And I, I guess that, that question is probably leaning more towards the rare earth side there, Curtis, yep. uh, considering we just answered the uranium. Sure. Well, I'd say the, the answer is uh, up till 
recently, no on uranium and yes on rare earths. <laughs> so, um, you know, and rare earths is, uh, you know, it's a much more, I'd say, complicated sort of a, a supply chain. And I think that the options for the United States uh, government to support certain projects has been somewhat limited. And, uh, you know, and it's just sort of been the same couple of projects kind of rolling around for the last, you know, a couple of decades. Um, you know, we are relative newcomers to the whole to the whole scene. You know, again, we went from being nowhere in the rare earth space to all of a sudden producing the most advanced rare earth material in the United States at commercial levels. Um, and I still think there's some people trying to get their heads around what it is that we're doing, what are our capabilities, is this real? Um, and so, uh, but there is, there has been quite a bit of money. I mean, in fact, there was just the government uh, just gave $120 million to an Australian company to build a heavy separation plant in Texas with no source of feed. I mean, I, I mean, I think they've, I hate to say it, but you know, had some money and didn't really know what to do with it. And so they've been kind of scrambling around trying to <laughs> find some way to, 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 to spend it. But um, there are better options out there. And I would submit that we are probably one of the best, if not the best. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Stephen, Global Atomic is permitted. You've, you've been offered debt. You now have a small offtake here, probably looking for more, you said. Uh, you, you're moving things forward at sort of, sort of a measured pace right now, construction underway. Uh, but grades are excellent. You can make money at 35 bucks, let alone near 50 bucks. Is there a desire to speed things up at all uh, now you're this close? And, and you know, might the uh, ore processing agreement with Arano you know, help, help in these plans? Yeah, I think from a technical point of view, David, uh, we, we're going to get into a, <clears throat> a detailed engineering phase now over the next few months and ordering long, long lead items. Uh, Q1 next year, we start construction on the plant. So I don't think you can really speed that process up. Uh, it's, you know, 18 to 24 month process to put that kind of facility in place. Uh, the mining will be well underway, and uh, by the end of next year, early 24, we could start shipping ore to Arano. So that's the idea, is, uh, is to have a, uh, an early stage cash flow by doing those ore shipments up the road. Uh, so we signed a half a million ton contract with them where we could deliver 100,000 tons a year for five years. And that actually provides a fairly significant cash flow, uh, even at 100,000 tons a year, because your grades are going to be, you know, somewhere between 11 and 15 pounds per ton. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a really good way to help finance construction of the plant. And if you have any hiccups with long lead items or construction, you can continue and, and continue generating cash flow through that agreement. And of course, our cash flow coming out of Turkey as well. So that's that's the schedule right now. Okay, great. And uh, just sort of to wrap it up here, uh, Bill uh, for, of Encore, do you foresee expansion of uh, both of your ISR plants in South Texas, Rosita and Kingsville Dome? And you know, are are the well fields really the limiting factor here? And what what do you need for a uranium price to get those up and running? Well, they are. I mean, we're, we're very uh, much benefited by having our first two well fields literally uh, on, on the project, uh, on the grounds of the, of the central processing plant and also at depths under 250 feet. So our production costs on the first two well fields will be uh, very, very nice. Uh, shall we say definitely have a three handle on them. So, uh, you know, the rest of it, uh, you know, we're doing delineation drilling on a second project as we speak, uh, about 50 miles away from the, the central plant. Uh, we will be taking under, uh, undertaking detailed, uh, you know, I don't know, studies, if you will, to determine whether the next move is to uh, retrofit uh, the Kingsville plant, bring it up to standards, or to uh, accelerate the expansion of Rosita. Here again, neither plant's uh, restricted by permit in terms of production, so uh, it's simply a matter of installing equipment. And we're looking at probably six million capex to uh, and upgrade uh, uh, both to the two million capacity and, and then an extra million for uh, some of the controls at Kingsville. Uh, but uh, you know that that's the limiting factor there, and then you know how fast you can develop well fields, and you know, even diesel starts to become a factor. But uh, every aspect of drilling it and casing it, and you know PVC pipe's been the biggest hangup actually in terms of casing the wells, in terms of uh, supply chain. So we're dealing with supply chain and inflation. Uh, but here again, having your initial startup uh, a stone's throw from your plant uh, 
and, and shallow uh, really really helps the uh, initial lift. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. 